pastoral question that I want to address today. Uh, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to John chapter 5. start in verse 24 and just read down a couple verses so that you understand the context of the, the question here. Uh, starting in verse 24, uh, Jesus is speaking and he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment, because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Um, yeah, it did, uh, verse 30, I can do nothing on my own, as I hear I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Okay, so the context that I, that I want you to kind of focus on here, if I understand the question correctly, um, women communicate with men uh, entirely differently. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I tend to do a lot of parenthetical statements in the midst of the statement I'm trying to make. But sometimes, um, you know, women have a lot more words than men do. And, and for whatever, it works when you're talking with women because you have the same amount of words. But when you're talking with men, it just exhausts them. <laughs> because we get to our limit of words and we're done. Okay, so if I understand the question correctly, what we want to focus on here is Jesus is saying that the time is coming when the tombs will open, uh, the dead will hear his voice, and they will come out. Now, hold your finger in that spot. We're going to flip back to Matthew chapter 27. <clears throat> We're going to start down in verse 50. Just to give you context, this is uh, at the crucifixion. Jesus is on the cross. Um, he has already called out for deliverance. Uh, so down in, in verse 50, says, And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were open, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised, and coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. Um, now, the, the question is... Are these two passages connected? And, and what would be the apparent connection would be the tombs opening and the dead coming out. Uh, so the question is, the first question is, are these two uh, passages connected? No. Um, and what is the meaning of John 5, 24 through 30? That's going to take a little bit longer to answer. Um, I don't believe these two passages are connected for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first being, uh, when Jesus is speaking in the book of John, uh, I don't think he's, he's uh, addressing something as mundane as just our physical lives. Uh, if we look back uh, further up where, where we read, we see that uh, everyone is dead until they come to life in Christ. Okay. So it's not a matter of you were living and then you died. It's a matter of you were dead and then brought to life. Um, so reading that in context, I believe what Jesus is speaking here 
uh, in, in, in two, two different positions here. I think he's speaking about the gift of salvation where the dead will come to life, but then further down, I think he's speaking about judgment. Okay? And I don't believe in Matthew that these two are connected because Matthew clearly says that it was the righteous, it was the saints who came out of the tombs and they went into the city and, and they were seen by many. It says nothing about um, any of the others that, that were not saints. Uh, I also believe that this is uh, not speaking of that because um, Both, please. <clears throat> we know that there will be... <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> well, let, let me back up first. When we celebrate um, Easter, what feast are, are we actually celebrating with Judaism? Passover is early. First, fruits. First fruits. And that's why Paul is so specific when he says that Jesus is the first fruits from the dead. Because he is the first one that was raised to life from death and didn't die again. Okay? I, 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 my brain works differently. And I can't help but wonder what Lazarus was thinking when... Jesus woke him up and brought him out of the tomb. As near as we can tell, he was in Abraham's bosom. He's being comforted. You mean I got to go back? Okay. And and so he comes out of the tomb. And can you imagine how weird that must have been for him? You're not feeling well. You're laying in bed. And, and then the next thing you know, you're wrapped up in sheets with all kinds of spices. And somebody's telling you to come out. And, uh, but it, what most people don't pick up on is that the Pharisees and the leaders that were looking to put Jesus to death, when he raised Lazarus, they also <coughs> looked for a reason to put Lazarus to death. Because he was a living testimony to the power of Jesus Christ. So if that being the case, he is resurrected to life with a target on his head. Okay. He, he comes back and, and everybody that's been raised to life except Jesus died again. Okay. He is the first fruits from the dead because he is the first one that is resurrected from the dead never to die again. Okay. So we know that there is, uh, Jesus has the first fruits. These that came out of the tomb in Matthew, um, Jesus had not raised from the dead yet, been risen uh, from the grave. But um, they went out and they went into the city. Uh, the people that saw them, can you imagine the chaos that that would have caused? Um, yeah, uh, sometimes I'm glad that I, I, I don't live through the things that happened here and I can just read about them. Sometimes I really would like to be there and just watch. Um, so... We know that there is a resurrection for each and every person, Jesus being the first fruits of a resurrection from the dead. Um, in 1 Thessalonians, Paul says that the dead in Christ will rise first. We believe this to be when Christ comes in the rapture, the harpazo. Uh, he raised up the dead in Christ, not all of the dead, just those who were in Christ. And they go up in the air to meet him. Then those who remain will go up in the air to meet him. The... Um, the uh, material, or not material, the, uh, oh, come on. The mortal will put on immortality, uh, and we will become like he is. Okay, so we know there is a resurrection that happens there that is specific to believers. Okay, but that resurrection isn't for us to come out of the tomb and walk around on the earth. It's being caught away. The, the Greek word is actually to be snatched up. I was going to snatch up Finn, but he looks really happy sitting in that box they put him in. <laughs> so I won't snatch him up right now. Okay, so we know there's a resurrection for the believers, but there is also a resurrection for the unbelievers. And both of these resurrections, believe it or not, will face a judgment. 
Now, the believer's judgment is not based on whether or not you're saved. Okay? If you remember in Revelation, when the great judgment, the great white throne judgment takes place, books are opened up. Okay? And every deed is, is going to be revealed. Everything that you did, everything that you thought, good and bad, is going to be revealed. Okay? Now, in, in that context, the believer will be judged based on what they did for Christ on behalf of their Lord to receive the rewards that God has set aside for them. Okay? And, and for those of you that, that uh, oh, we're not going to be at the great white throne judgment, I know we will be judged based on what we did. All right? You look back, uh, Jesus told the parable of the, the three servants with the talents. Okay, one was given five, one was given three, one was given one. Now, um, in that parable, the one that had five earned five more and was blessed and was called into his master's rest. The one that had three, or two, gained two more and he was brought into his master's rest. Those are the rewards that they were given. Uh, in, in another parable, he does the same thing, but he does it with ten, and each is given uh, one talent, and the first one brought back ten talents in addition. Uh, then, yeah, they all brought back talents, except for the one at the end. Uh, the one that got the one talent, he went and buried it. Okay? Now, when he comes back to the master, what does he have? He has exactly what the master gave him. He has that talent. But because he did not make use of it, he did not do what his master's will was. He was not looking out for the benefit, the blessing of his master. He was only he was operating out of fear, right? Yeah. Oh man, he put this into my care, and I don't want to blow it. So I'm I'm gonna bury it. I'm hands off. I'm good. Now, when the master called him to account, he brought the one talent. Okay? Now, at the white throne judgment, I believe that there will be giving of, of rewards to those who are going to go to hell for the good deeds. Scripture says everyone will be judged according to their good deeds. I don't think it's going to matter a bit, though, because there is another book that is open, and it's the Lamb's Book of Life. All these other books are irrelevant in eternity if your name is not in the Lamb's Book of Life. So when people are saying, hey, you know, I've, I've led a pretty good life. I've, I've done some good things. You can't do enough good things. Y you can't. Okay? Sin always outweighs good deeds. If we could be saved by good deeds, we would have no need for Christ. We would have no need for the cross. We would all be back under the law and all of the law and would be required to meet all of it. Okay? And Jesus even took this a step further because the, the, the law dealt with your actions. Jesus said sin deals with your thoughts. All right? Sin is, is, is brought up from within. You know? You're not going to steal if you don't want it. It's not going to happen. Okay? So when, when they are resurrected, I believe in some measure they will be given rewards, but the rewards are going to be insignificant in eternity because they are going straight into hell, the lake of fire. Now, the believer is going to be rewarded as well, and in a way that doesn't matter because what are we going to do with our rewards? We're going to put them at his feet. We're going to lay them down because he's worthy. Okay? Now, for those of you who go, oh, you know, I'm, I'm not really about the rewards. I'm just serving as a good servant. Hooey. Hooey. Because I used to be there. I used to believe that. I don't believe that anymore because if Jesus said it was important enough that you were going to be rewarded, I think we should be busy working to be rewarded so that when that time comes that we have things to lay at his feet, we have things to lay at his feet. Okay? I don't want to be the guy that flips a quarter. There's, that's what I got. All right? I want to have much to present to him. Okay? So, back to our question. The resurrections and the judgments. I don't believe these are connected. What I believe is happening in John chapter 5, Jesus is, is basically summing up the entirety of the gospel 
the need for the gospel, the basis of the gospel, in just a couple short statements. Because what's required unto salvation? Death. Yeah. Well, yeah, but here, in context of what it's saying. <coughs> Believe. He says, um, well, let me back up. Uh, verse 24, truly, truly. Now, when you see those two words, or in your version it might say, verily, verily. <clears throat> I actually knew a woman whose name was Verily, but it wasn't like that. Um, when he repeats himself, you've got to pay attention, because what he is getting ready to say is significant, it's important. And he says, he starts this off by saying, truly, truly, I say to you, okay? That would be like scout's honor. This is what I'm telling you, it's significant. I, um, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Now take that passage and overlay that over John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him would not perish but have everlasting life. I did not come into the world to judge the world but that through me the world might have life. The world already stands judged. Everybody that was ever born and ever will be born has already been judged. Okay? And thanks to Adam and thanks to our own nature we have offended God. We have done what is not right. However, God saw that we were not going to be able to make it. I mean, wow. In the garden, they had one rule. One. And they blew it. Okay? They, they, they lost it. From that moment on, all are born in sin by the nature handed down to us from Adam and every one of us sins. I love Finn. But you're a sinner. Aww. And if you don't believe me, come to my house about 2.30 in the morning. All right? In the morning. Because he has temper tantrums. <laughs> Ooh, and I can hear it upstairs in my room. <laughs> I don't hear a lot about what mom and dad are saying, but uh, I, I certainly hear, um, I'm sure that they may have stumbled a time or two in that as well. But uh, we have the Adamic nature, and, and so we are all dealing with sin, but God in his great love for us, saw from the beginning of time, not his time, our time, God exists outside of time, he saw what was going to happen, he saw down through eternity, he saw my need, he saw your need, he saw that separation, the, the burden that we in no wise could carry on our own, the, the relationship that we in no way could repair on our own, and he took it upon himself to send himself as the Son to take our place for the punishment that was due for anyone that sinned, okay? And so God, who is at one and same time the absolute perfect, righteous, holy judge, and that judgment requires our lives as forfeit, he is also a God of infinite mercy, infinite love, infinite grace, and he, both of those things came together in a beautiful scene at Calvary on the cross. Okay? And love one. Okay? Not because God became less just or less righteous, but because he took upon himself the price of sin and paid it on our behalf. Okay? Um, I, I, occasionally, um, as God wills, I really like to pay for the meals of, of people at a restaurant, especially people that I know served. Okay, and, and that's everything from, I, I've been able to bless uh, a gentleman that served in World War II, uh, Korea, Vietnam, uh, I've, I've served, uh, been able to bless some, some active duty soldiers, 
and, and I always want to do it anonymously. I don't want anybody to know what's going on, but, you know, I've had the occasion to be on the other side of that. And, and when the bill comes and the bill is not there, it, it's paid in full, they don't stand there and demand that you pay the bill again. <laughs> there might be some sketchy restaurants that would do that, okay, because people, we already talked about sin, okay? There might be, but they should not require it. That's why it says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. God is no less just now than he was before the cross, but the, everything, the, the righteous requirements of the law have been met. So, coming back to this, I believe Jesus is laying out the gospel right here. And, and what he is showing, we, he's showing the, the condition that we're in before him, he's showing us what comes because of him, and then he says, you know, what comes after? Those that believe to life, those that don't believe to judgment. And trust me, you do not want to be under the judgment of God because he knows everything you did. I know there are things that I did that deserved punishment that I got away with. And to be honest with you, I probably don't remember a lot of them. Not that I was an overly <coughs> evil child. I just had a lot of um, exuberance. <laughs> um, and not a lot of common sense. And so uh, Todd and I, my mom called us the sons of Boanerges the sons of thunder, because um, we fought all the time. We are about as different as you can be. Um, and for whatever reason, I, I just, I like to needle him. And, uh, and when I needled him, he liked to hit me. Uh, but I know there are things that I don't remember that I did wrong. There are sins that I committed that I, I just don't remember. God doesn't forget those. He knows those. Every one of them is written down. And you will give an account to them. And, and the only way you can give an account to them is to say, yeah, I, I did all those things, but the price has been made. Or, I did all those things, what are you going to do about it? Because when Scripture says they're, they're thrown out where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, do you understand what the gnashing of teeth is? That's, that's not mourning. That's hatred. As a matter of fact, you look, and there are several times throughout Scripture, and even in the Gospels, where, where the religious leaders gnash their teeth at the gospel. So, so when people are cast into hell, yeah, there, there, there's going to be mourning, but there's also going to be hatred. They are going to rail against God because they are his enemies. Scripture says that before we came to Christ, we were God's enemy. All right. So what does all this do? I think this has to do with um, the gospel message. I think Jesus is summarizing it very concisely here for us. The dead will be raised. I believe absolutely there will be resurrections. Uh, resurrections, plural. Uh, I believe that those that were in Abraham's bosom, when Jesus was resurrected and he went to heaven, they went with him. I don't believe when you die, you go down to Abraham's bosom. I believe that in the moment you die, as Paul says in uh, Philippians 1, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I believe our soul immediately goes into the presence of the Lord. But we are not just souls. Are we? Because if you think you're just a soul, come up here, I'll pinch you. All right? We are a tripartite being. We have a body, we have a soul, we have a spirit. And at that resurrection of the just, the resurrection of the believers, the resurrection of the children of God, our soul will be reunited with our body. That body will, will put the perishable, will put off the imperishable, the mortal will put off, uh, will take on immortality, and we will become like he is, and everything will go back together the way God intended it to be. Body, soul, and spirit. Okay? So, here, the other resurrection, the resurrection of the dead, uh, that are, and I don't mean because everybody that's resurrected by inference, they have to be dead. <laughs> Although, when Benjamin gets up in the morning, sometimes it's like a resurrection. <laughs> and, and Judah. Judah takes a while to warm up to the idea of being awake. Um, I don't know how much of a gift it is, but it is a gift that they can lay down and just boop, go to sleep. Um, so, all of these things taken together, I don't believe they're connected. Uh, the passage in Matthew 27 
the passage in John 5. I believe they're two entirely separate things. Um, but there is resurrection. You know, when the, the, the saints were raised and they went into the city, um, what I think personally, I have no basis for, for this being true or not. This is just what I think. So right now, this is opinion. All right? Don't go out and tell people, well, my pastor said. You can say, well, my pastor thinks. Sometimes. <laughs> okay? And what I think happened when the saints came up and they went in, I think kind of what was going on there is what the rich man asked of Lazarus. Go and tell my brothers. And, and Abraham said, ha, if they're not going to listen to the law and the prophets, what makes you think they're going to listen to him? All right? I think, I think the saints went in, into the city and they said, hey, look, pay attention. Something big's happening. I would be freaked out. I, I, I mean, you know, my, my grandpa shows up at my door. Yeah. Yeah, no thanks. Okay. So, so that's what I think. I think they went in and, and they were proclaiming the gospel, that, that the gospel, that the price has been paid. All right. So, done with that. Uh, did that answer the question properly? Are you satisfied? Yep. Are you satisfied? I will leave it up here for you to get afterwards. Uh, if you have a question that you would like me to answer, the Ask the Pastor questions are on the credenza. Write it out. Um, if you want me to get it back to you, put your name on it. If you want it anonymous, don't put your name on it. I'll just, when I answer it, I'll just leave it up here for you to get. Um, you have a question about a passage of scripture, about doctrine, about theology, or, you know, whatever. Uh, write it out. Um, if it's complicated, write it out and then talk to me, okay? Because sometimes I read them and I end up answering something completely different than what was asked. So, um, yeah. All right, Philippians chapter one. Turn with me if you would. We talked about the, the kind of the introduction of Philippians. We talked about um, how the church at Philippi was established, how God prevented uh, Paul and Silas from going into Bithynia and rerouted them to Macedonia. We talked about uh, the first convert on the continent of Europe being Lydia, the seller of purple, and her household. Um, we talked about the significance of Philippi in the Roman world. It was at a crossroads. It was on a trade route. Um, after um, Octavian became Augustus and he took upon the name of divinity, um, he made the community at Philippi uh, a, a colony of Rome, which meant everybody that lived in Philippi automatically gained Roman citizenship and that, that, that's significant in that time and place because as a Roman citizen you were guaranteed certain rights that other people in the empire were not given. And so um, we, we talked a little bit about the background of the, the city. We talked a little bit about um, how it came to be. We talked about the establishment of the church. Um, if you missed any of that, I would encourage you to go back to Acts chapter 16 and read that. That's the account of uh, Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke going to uh, Philippi and establishing the church and all the things that went on there. So, so today, we're getting into chapter 1, and my goal today is to finish verse 1. All right? You guys hang with that? Okay. Now, for those of you that think that it's going to be a short service, it might be. Nobody applauded. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. All right. So, verse 1, chapter 1. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, 
with the overseers and deacons. Now, one of the things that, that kind of cracks me up, um, I don't understand why we've westernized all these names. I, I really don't. Um, you know, I don't even know, you know, how they would change my name if they went from what it is now to whatever language they were translating it into. But a person's name is a person's name. You know, we, we're, we're talking about Paul, and he's like, what? Who? Who's Paul? Because that, that's not his name. Well, first, his name wasn't Paul. It was Saul. Saul. On the first missionary journey, um, when he and Barnabas uh, were first starting out, they went to the proconsul, uh, whose name was uh, Sergius Paulos. And then the next place they went to, Saul took upon the name of Paul. Except it wasn't Paul, it was Paulos. Okay? And, and that was his name. That's what he went by. Um, uh, Timothy was uh, Timotheus. Uh, both of those are Greek renditions. Um, Timothy had a Greek father, so that was most likely the name that he was given at birth. I would imagine he also had a Hebrew name because his mother and grandmother were Hebrew, but uh, we don't have any indication of what that was or whether it even was. Uh, the, the fact that Paul and Timothy are declaring themselves at the start, um, a lot of times people question who actually wrote the particular epistles. This epistle has universally been accepted across the early church as being an authentic Pauline epistle. Nobody that was in the church, the early church fathers, the early church, nobody questioned that Paul wrote this. Okay, so this is one of those ones. There's a couple others. Uh, Hebrews, there's a lot of speculation as to whether Paul wrote Hebrews or some other person. I don't think Paul wrote it. And the reason I don't think that he wrote it is because Paul was well versed in the Hebrew Bible and the writer of Hebrews was not. Okay? Because the writer of Hebrews is my hero because he says, somewhere in the scriptures it says. <laughs> okay? Paul, he, he can name a chapter and verse. Well, no, he can't because they didn't have chapter and verse, but he can tell you where it was found. Okay? So Paul and Timothy, servants. I want to read something to you. You know what that word means? Slave. Slave. All right. I am in the preface of the ESV Bible. I don't know if yours will have this. If any... Um, quality manuscript or translation should have a note about this, okay? Because when they translated the Bible into English, the word used for slave, uh, it, it, they changed it in context because of the way the Western world views slavery, okay? So in a lot of places, especially in the New Testament, in the, the uh, Old Testament, it was edited, in the New Testament, it's doulos, and there's, when that same word is used in a negative as being a slave to sin, they put slave in there. But then when they give you the alternative, they say a bond servant or a servant of Jesus Christ. So I'm just going to read this so you understand why that happened, okay? Uh, a particularly difficulty in, is presented when words in Biblical Hebrew and Greek refer to an ancient practice and institution that do not directly correspond to those in the modern world. Such is the case of the translation of Ebed and Dulos, terms which are often rendered slave. These terms, however, actually cover a range of relationships that require a range of rendering either slave, bondservant, or servant, depending on the context. Further, the word slave currently carries association <coughs> with the often brutal and dehumanizing institution of slavery in 19th century America. For this reason, the ESV translation of the word Ebed and Dulos has been undertaken with particular attention to their meaning in each specific context. Thus, in Old Testament times, one might enter slavery either voluntarily or involuntarily. Um, 
uh, protection for all in servitude in ancient Egypt was provided by the Mosaic law. In New Testament times, a doulos is often best described as a bond servant, that is, as someone bound to a servant, uh, uh, someone bound to serve his master for a specific and usually <coughs> lengthy period of time, but also as someone who might nevertheless own property, uh, achieve social advancement, and even be released to purchase his freedom. The ESV usage thus seats, as in Romans 6, no, thus seeks to express the nuance of meaning in each context, where absolute ownership by a master is in view, as in Romans 6, slave is used, where a more limited form of servitude is in view, bond servant is used, uh, where the context indicates a wide range of freedom, servant is preferred. So uh, most translations uh, will, will put a footnote underneath to tell you the word. Um, really what it comes down to, very simply, is... Um, we don't like the word slave. Okay. And, and I, I, I get somewhat taken aback that, that this is you know, slammed on America in the 18th century. Um, slavery was around a long time before it ever came to America. Um, the reason it came to America is people from countries that had slaves came to America. Uh, and slavery has been around and is still around. Uh, I'm not saying that it's a good thing by any means. Uh, I think that uh, it's a travesty. I don't believe that God desires that anyone would be a slave to anything but himself. And, you know, the difference between a slave and a bond servant, uh, just to give you a little bit of context in this, is that uh, a slave was actually property of the owner. Uh, in Mosaic law, there were certain things that you could do and couldn't do to a Hebrew slave. And uh, if, for whatever reason, you, you became unable to pay your bills, you became unable to sustain your family, you could choose to voluntarily go into slavery, uh, to servanthood, to a member of your family, and they would take you and you would come in, you would work for them, and then uh, at the year of Jubilee, all debts are erased, you are set free, the property that you had is restored to you, and, and you can make a go of it. Now, when a person voluntarily put themselves in that place and the time came for them to be set free, whether because the debt was paid or because um, the time had come, they had the choice to continue on in service. And oftentimes they would do this and there was a procedure to indicate that you chose this service. And the, the uh, owner, or the master, would take you and they put your ear up against the lintel post and they drive an awl through it. Boom. I hear people say, Al, uh, how many of you have pierced ears? <laughs> okay, we got two that kind of. <laughs> Is this a sin? I'm not sure. <laughs> don't, don't, don't worry about it. God's grace covers everything. Yeah. All right. Um, so, they would put the all through their ear and then they would put a ring in the ear to indicate that this person has voluntarily come under service to this person. Now when Paul is talking about us being a bond servant, we are delivered from our sin when we come to salvation, right? Amen. We are no longer subject to sin. Okay, We're no longer subject to the law. We're under grace and, and the law that we have is actually a higher law than, than the Mosaic law. So when we choose to do that, he uses that procedure to, to explain to us why we are bond servants because you voluntarily, you willingly go into this relationship. You want this, okay? And then it becomes the master's responsibility to make sure you're taken care of. You do whatever task he gives to you, he makes sure you're taken care of, all right? So, doulos, back to chapter one, verse one. All right, um, oh, that's Revelation. We're not in Revelation yet, guys. Although that is coming. All right. Paul and Timothy, slaves, bond servants of Christ Jesus to all the saints. Um, all the saints. What is saint? Set apart. Set apart. Set apart to be made holy. Um, when we come into salvation... 
we use a lot of churchy words to explain things, and, and sometimes people come into the church and they have no idea what we're talking about. Uh, we get very adept at using Christian ease. Um, saint simply means somebody that is taken out and set aside. Somebody that is taken from the profane and the common and set aside to the holy. Okay? Sanctified, being set apart. God is absolutely holy because he's completely separate. All right? There is nothing in creation that in any way could, could compare to God. He, he just, he's separate. He doesn't need us. He doesn't need anything in creation. He doesn't need anything. He is eternally self-sufficient. But he very much wants us. Okay? So, God, when the Holy Spirit moves on a person and they come to that place where they make a decision, you know what? I want to give up the rights that I think I have to my life and, and I want to turn them over to you. I want to accept all that you have done for me. Save me. Okay? And sometimes it's not that clinical and that dry because sometimes it's more like, Save me! Yeah. I've had moments like that. Okay? Um, remember the Titanic? Yeah. I don't remember a lot about that movie. There are two things that I remember very distinctly, actually three things that I remember very distinctly about the movie. The first one is the uh, orchestra, the, the string quartet playing as the ship went down. The second one is the guy falling off the back of the ship and bouncing off the propeller. Yes, yeah. yeah. Um, the third one is how many people were in the water calling for help. They knew they were in trouble. They, they needed someone to come and pull them out of the danger they were in to save them. And our sin is like that ocean. And we're all drowning and, and we're calling out to the one that can save us and pull us out of that desperate situation, that deadly situation, and bring us to a place of safety. When we do that, when the Holy Spirit works, when, when we have called out for help, God does a miraculous thing in that he creates a new creation in place of the old one. We retain a lot of what we were and, and the, the physicality. My eyes didn't change color when I came to faith. Since I've come to faith, I've gone bald. Yeah. <laughs> That's a change that has nothing to do with salvation, at least I hope not. <laughs> the way I look at it is, you know, God has been very pleased with me, and he, he just... He, he constantly does, good job. Good job, kid. And he's just blowing it down. So I look at some of you <laughs> right now. That's not serious at all. Not at all. Um, so we become holy as he is holy. So when Paul is writing this letter, he is writing it to those who have been set apart as, as the church in the city of Philippi in the surrounding areas. All right? he, he's sending this to everyone in the fellowship there. All of the saints um, who are in Christ Jesus. Christ is not a name. It's a title. Um, and and I, I hear people say that, and, and it doesn't seem to bother them whether it comes first or second. They, they, you know, his, his mom didn't name him Christ Jesus. He didn't adopt that name because his father kept using it when he screwed up. Um, <laughs> You know, my dad had lovely nicknames for each of us when we did things, and, and I won't share what mine was. So, uh, but Christ is the Greek Christos, which is the equivalent of Mashiach, Messiah in the Hebrew. Both of them mean anointed. Okay? Now, in the Hebrew Bible, I know of two occasions, with the, with the third that actually kind of comes later, uh, in the New Testament, where a person is anointed. Can you think about when somebody has been anointed? The high priest. Well, actually, any of the priests were supposed to be anointed. But what, who else was anointed? What other class? The king. The kings and the priests were anointed. Okay? But Jesus, as we read in Hebrews, because if you were a king, you couldn't be a priest. If you were a priest, you couldn't be a king because they're from two entirely different tribes. Priests come out of Levi. The kings were supposed to come from Judah. But Jesus Christ is both 
from Judah, the lion of the tribe of Judah, and high priest after the order of not Aaron, but Melchizedek. Okay, he has a priesthood that existed before the nation of Israel existed. Okay, so he took those two classes and he brought them together in one person. David didn't do that. And David was one of the greatest kings in all of Israel. Solomon didn't do that. Saul tried to do it, and it backfired big, didn't it? <clears throat> he made a sacrifice that he was not supposed to make. Okay, so we see that. Um, Jesus is the Messiah. He is the anointed one, not just an anointed one. He is the. Um, who are at Philippi, those of you that, that are there, uh, with along with the overseers and the deacons. Now, we talked about this some months back. Uh, the overseers, that word is episkopos. Uh, does, anybody, does that sound familiar to anyone? There's an entire denomination that uses that name. Yeah. The Episcopals. Yeah. And it's interesting because um, here in, in the ESV, it translates it overseers. Does somebody have it translated as something different uh, in, in one of the other translations? Bishops. Bishops. Yeah. Um, the, the word Episcopos actually means a guardian. Okay? A, a guardian an overseer, somebody who is put in charge to look after something, okay? So we see, and, and when we spoke about the roles in the church, we saw that uh, in, in uh, the book of Acts, I believe it was chapter 6, um, the, the elders, the overseers, the apostles were approached by some of the Greek women or the, the Gentile women and saying, hey, we're not getting our portion of the daily sustenance or giving it all to the Jewish people and, and we're receiving nothing. Well, the, the overseers talked about it and they prayed about it. They're like, this is not something that we should be struggling with. We have been called to preach and to pray. So choose from yourselves seven men of good repute. And then Paul later lists the attributes and, and appoint them to this task. And that created a second group of leaders in the church, the diakonos, or the deacons. And, and what does diakonos mean? Servant. Table waiter. Yeah. It, it, in, in context, it means either servant, or the, the context in Acts is actually a waiter. Yeah. Somebody who serves at the table. Now, we look at that and we go, wow. Okay, there, you want a leader to be somebody that waits at the table? Remember the Last Supper. Yeah. Jesus said, this is the model of, of leadership that I want you to have. I want you to be a servant. Yeah. And he went and he washed all their feet. And he set the example. The leader serves. You want a good leader, find a good server. Okay? So, here we go. Um, Paul and Timothy, Paulos and Timotheus, uh, servants, doulos, bond servants, slaves of... Jesus, the anointed one, to all of the saints, all of those that are holy, all of those that are set apart uh, in Philippi, along with the elders, the overseers, the episcopos, and the deacons, the diakonos, the servants, the servers. Um, I'm writing to you. So, I'm going to leave with this. Everybody in the church of Philippi, this is written to. Everybody sitting here, this is written to. Now, when Paul sat down, and, and I believe he dictated this, uh, I, I believe he had very poor eyes. Uh, we see in Galatians, he talks about, see what large letters I have written. Uh, I think he had eye problems, but that's that's speculation on my part. Um, I think he probably had an amanuensis right for him, uh, transcribe what he was saying. Um, he thought maybe he was just writing to the church of Philippi. But God, who is the actual author of all of the Bible, knew that this was going to be far beyond just the borders in the time of Philippi.